is a talk on coroutines, uh, which is involves threading, uh, but more so, and lots of other things. Uh, just a quick background, I'm Jock Smuts. Uh, I started coding Android in 2014, uh, Kotlin in 2018, which is when I joined the Flat Circle, a development agency in Cape Town that make Android and iOS apps. And 2019, we started using coroutines uh, fairly aggressively because they are very, very nice. Um, we played around with the experimental in 2018, but uh, uh, when coroutines came into stable, we started using them whenever we can because they are very good. Um, so a lot of what you're about to see comes from my own personal experiences or with using coroutines. I have some basic working knowledge. Uh, I'm also a member of GDG Cape Town, which is where I gave this talk. Um, and uh, please, please feel free to visit Cape Town. Uh, the GDG people there are very nice. So uh, first off, what is a coroutine? Now this was defined in, I think, 1958 uh, in assembly language. Uh, and the basic premise is uh, a coroutine is a subroutine that can be suspended and resumed. Uh, and from a programming perspective, that's, that's actually a really, really big deal. Um, if you if you don't think about it, it, it seems like a, a fairly arbitrary thing, but it's actually very important because we are used to working with blocking code. Every time you run a function, that function will complete. It will run to the to the end. It cannot be cancelled. It cannot be stopped. You can only have internal controls which allows it to exit, but you, you can't stop a function once it starts, uh, and you can pause it, which is different from coroutines which is suspendable functions. Uh, so first, I'm just going to do some basic threading. Um, I assume that you know the basics of how threading works coming from an Android or Java background, uh, but uh, I'm going to go over the background just a little bit. So uh, normal threading, you have a single thread, um, which in Android, and most of the talk will focus on Android context, has a main thread of some kind. And the main thread, you have lots of little operations, and everything needs to happen at least 60 times a second in order to not uh, interfere with the uh, main uh, UI components or anything like that. Uh, so anything that blocks your thread for longer than a few milliseconds is going to become visible to the user. So when you run into a long running operation, uh, if you don't know anything about threading, you just put it on the main thread. Uh, and then what's going to happen is you're going to have some glitchy behavior. Your UI is going to be unrun badly. You're going to have stuff like that happen, uh, which is obviously not ideal. Uh, so you find out about some basic threading where you put something on a different thread. So now you reach the long operation. And what now happens is, uh, you know, okay, this should not be on the main thread. So you, you start a new operation on the new thread and end that operation that was on the main thread. So now you've got a async task or a Oryx Java operation of some kind. And that goes on the computation thread or the IO thread. And it can take as long as it needs because it's, it's, um, it's not on the main thread. It, it can take its time. Uh, and then eventually, when it gets the result, you go, okay. I have the result, everything is fine and calculated. Now I just need to pass the result back to the UI thread. It sends a callback result back to the UI thread by creating, calling a new function, usually through an interface of a listener of some kind, or uh, if, you, if you publish something via an observable of some kind, like, uh, as I said before, Eric Java. Um, you should be fairly familiar with this basic concept, but uh, a coroutine is a little bit different. Uh, and it's very really subtle, so I'm going to go over this a few times and come back to this later as well. So you're on the main thread, same as before, you get a long running operation. And now where normally you would call, you would end it there and pass in a listener of some kind. Now you still have exactly the same long running operation on the IO thread or the background thread of some kind. And that happens exactly the same as before. However, now when you're done and you're sending the callback back, you're not starting an entirely new operation. You're not uh, having a listener that uh, responds to it or whatever. You're just passing it back to exactly where you got it from. 
which is the suspended code. And then the suspended code reactivates, if you want to call it that, it resumes, uh, and it's back on the main thread, and then it continues as before. So it's a way of pausing code without blocking the thread. So it is difficult to envision, obviously. So some code examples. First off, uh, we're going to use a normal callback. I'm trying to avoid Rx Java here, so we are using uh, Firebase instance. A lot of people know this or know something like it, where you have some sort of operation. In this case, let's say we're working with a user, uh, and we want to get his username. Now, this is a fairly standard way. Uh, you have an instance of some kind or a library, and then you get username, and then what you're passing in there is a Lambda block. Inside the Lambda block, you've got the return value, which is username. Uh, and then the handle result is just our local function for handling the, the username that comes back. This is fairly standard, and a lot of people have seen this code already. Uh, but then it gets a, a little bit more complicated fairly quickly, because now you want to get friends as well. So we're getting data for a user, you're getting the username, you're getting the friends. But now the problem is here, what, what is the order of events here? So we're getting the username first. We're not handling the result because this is asynchronous. So this, then we're getting the friends. Then we're getting the result of the username or the friends. We're not sure what the order is, but most, most likely we're getting the, the, friend, the username first and then the friends. But we, we cannot be guaranteed of anything, so we handle the result with both of being null. This is, I've seen this code before. It's not the best. Uh, but it works. Some people say, OK, let's force it to be a uh, serial operation, not parallel. Uh, then you do something like this, uh, where you say you get the username. And if that has been a success uh, or a failure event, depending, uh, you, you get the friends. And then you handle the result of both. Uh, this is also fairly standard. With, with Oryx Java, you would, you would chain operations to a flat map of different operations. And it gets very complicated as well. Um, but in real world, it, it, I mean, I've seen this code, except that it, it looked a bit more like this, where you say, get the username, and if the username is null or empty, uh, is not null or empty, then get friends and then handle the result. I'll show an error, and it gets, it gets pretty bad. And this is commonly known as callback L, because you're passing in a lambda, and then it's an if statement, and then in there, you you're passing in another lambda, and it's just a bunch of callbacks, callbacks, callbacks. Um, and there's no easy way to avoid this uh, under normal circumstances, which is why a lot of people use something like Oryx Java, because you can chain operations. But then you've fallen into the operator trap. Whereas uh, with coroutines, it's a little bit nicer. Uh, so I just need to call out something very important here. This symbol that you see there, that is the symbol for a suspended function. A suspend function is a function that can only be called from a coroutine context, and it can be suspended and resumed. That's about it. There's more to it, but this is important that that symbol, you will see it. The moment you start working with coroutines, you will see it everywhere. So just keep an eye out. So. Here we have a coroutine example, exactly the same operation. We're going to get data. Uh, and now we're just going to launch something. Now, global scope means that it's a bit of a fire and forget operation. We just, we don't care about the scope. We don't care about maintaining memory safety or anything. We're just launching a coroutine. Uh, so, uh, and, but we will fix that later. Uh, so here we have. Username, Firebase instance dot get username suspend, and then we handle the result. Uh, and you'll see that little symbol on the left. Uh, of course, I'm assuming here that if you're if you're using Firebase or whatever library you're using, that there is a suspend function, uh, and a lot of the popular libraries do have suspend functions. Uh, but we'll also cover that a little bit later. Uh, in this case. You see here, it looks like a blocking function. I'm not passing in a, a callback. 
I'm getting it and immediately get the result. Even though this operation takes maybe a second, uh, or at least hundreds of milliseconds, um, that is not something that happens uh, immediately, but it doesn't block the thread uh, because it's paused while that uh, suspend operation is happening. And then we handle the result. And so far, it doesn't look that much better than the original. At the moment, you add a little bit of complexity. Now we've got friends, Firebase instance of get friends suspend. Now we've got two operations. And what is the order of events here? Well, that's fairly simple. It's we're getting the username, and then regardless of the result, we're getting the friends. There's ways to do this um, uh, concurrently. That's fairly easy. I'm not going to cover that right now, but um, the the nice thing here is that even if you know nothing about coroutines, you can see the order of events. It all seems fairly simple, and you can add further ones as well, whatever makes sense to you. However, the thing to keep in mind is that we're handling the result there, uh, and if you are using Android, that result needs to be. If you're displaying something on the on the on the view on the UI thread. Uh, you will get a crash because it needs to be put back on the UI thread when you're done. And so a lot of people are used to using something like handler.post um, or run on UI thread. But with Caroutine, it's actually fairly simple. You can launch this entire operation on the main thread. You just uh, pass in the dispatcher that you want. And you can use one of three dispatchers, main, IO, and default. Fairly simple. Um, the main thread is, is an Android specific one, which is the UI thread. IO is input output operations like API calls, and default would be the default one, the computation thread, where any long running calculation would take place. But um, the important bit here is that now all of these operations seem to be running on, on the main thread, and that seems wrong. You, you feel like, wait, no, these things should not be on the main thread. But this is actually fine because in that Firebase operation, they do the thread switching themselves to make sure everything happens fine. And even if they don't, we can do that ourselves as well. But in this case, we assume that uh, it's switching the threads inside uh, of the Firebase library and then returning. And then the only thing that's happening on the main thread actually is in this block of code is assigning the username, assigning the friends, assigning the location, and then handling the result. So this will find this will not crash, and this will be completely fine as long as that Firebase library uh, does the thread switching internally. So let's just uh, go through uh, our example again, uh, the animation I had before, where you have the main thread, and then you have a long-running operation. In this case, get friends or get username. Uh, so that code is paused uh, where the get friends Firebase operation happens in the background on the computation on the IO thread. That takes us however long it needs to go. Then you get the callback result, and this passes it back to the friends uh, assignment of the variable that we had. And then it goes to the next line of code. And that would be uh, get location. Uh, and this would repeat for whatever uh, suspend operation you do. So there's some uh, tips, uh, some points on what suspend functions can do. They can do quite a lot of things. These are, I think, uh, one of the most, the, the more important points is suspend functions can pause or suspend without blocking the thread. And it can resume. So you've you've seen this uh, example now, where uh, val friends or val username uh, is not blocking the thread. The other thing that suspend functions can do is it can switch threads. Uh, so let's look at that example. Uh, we're back in the code we had before. We're using global scope dot launch dispatches dot main. Uh, however, now we're no longer using the, the Firebase library directly. 
let's assume that the Firebase library, library did not actually do this thread switching itself. Can we do the thread switching for it to make sure that we're on the IO thread or on the computation thread uh, ourselves? So that is luckily fairly easy. We're calling the get username function. Uh, and you'll see there it's got a suspend keyword at the at the beginning. Suspend fun get username. Uh, and that's all you you really need to do to to start using coroutines is if you use a suspend function, this function cannot be called from any context is except from a coroutine or from other suspend functions. So this is, is kind of a, a signal that, oh, this is not a normal blocking function. You should think about it differently. Uh, and you'll see uh, that little green arrow at the top left. That is going to be uh, there because the get username is a suspend function. It returns a string. So in this case, uh, we're calling firebase.getUsernames suspend. This is exactly the same as it was before. Except if you want to switch the um, thread, it's fairly easy with coroutines. You just say with context. And now what it's doing is it's returning a suspend function that runs on the IO thread. So you're reporting in that dispatcher.io. Uh, and that um, then whatever happens inside there happens in, on that thread. So it's very easy to th switch threads, which is why a lot of libraries do it fairly automatically, because it's so easy. Uh, and then finally, the other big thing that suspend functions can do is it can cancel. So I'm gonna see if I can get, show an example of that. But the, the big thing, the big difference in coding that cancellation does is it allows you to write infinite loops that it feels wrong to write an infinite loop. Like we've been taught for so long that you should avoid it. You will have memory leaks, you will have issues, uh, through, try to run forever. But if you can cancel an infinite loop, then there's no reason not to, to write an infinite loop if you know you're doing it correctly. So I'm going to try to show some example of how the cancellation works. Uh, so here we are in the same example we had before. We're launching something, global scope, on the main thread, and then we're getting the username, and we're handling the result. It's fairly simple. However, in our case, let's say we're inside a view model of some kind, but this could be any class. Um, if you implement a coroutine scope, what this does is it is an interface that allows you to launch without uh, defining the scope every time or the thread uh, because we defined it there in the interface. So in this case, coroutine scope by main scope, which means by default, it will launch every coroutine operation on the main dispatcher, on the main thread. And what it looks like is this. So because we're in this class, we can launch automatically. We don't have to define the scope because it, the class is taking care of that. Um, and this looks very nice. It's, it's very simple and easy to read. You just see launch and, oh, OK, this is a, a coroutine. There's that little symbol. Um, that makes a, a big difference for code readability, which is wonderful. However, uh, we still have to take care of a few things. On destroy. So uh, you should use that interface only within any uh, class that has a lifecycle or you know will ha have a on destroy or on clear or finish function like that. Because in the, the end of the lifecycle of this class or when it is destroyed by something else, then you can say coroutine context of cancel children. Because that coroutine scope interface at the top, it, it creates this coroutine context, which you can also uh, define for yourself. 
and the moment you say cancel children, it attempts to cancel all co-routines. Um, this doesn't work automatically, but for, for the most part, uh, most coroutines, most suspend functions uh, written in major libraries can be cancelled. The one thing that is important to note, however, that uh, it's only suspend function that can be cancelled. Blocking function cannot be cancelled. So if you look inside of that launch lambda, where we have the username, get username, and then a handle the result. So assuming you're calling that cancellation while the get username operation is running, then it can get cancelled um, because it is a suspend function. It is probably suspended at that point. So either it will be cancelled um, during the operation or when the result comes back, depending on the, on the function, and then uh, the handle result function will never be called. However, if the handle result function has been reached, and you call cancel on it, it cannot be canceled because it doesn't have that nice little symbol on the left which said, says this is a suspend function. So something to keep in mind. It's not magic. Cancel children doesn't just cancel all of the code. It only cancels the cancelable suspend functions. So some pros and cons of coroutines. Uh, code readability, which is, uh, I think you've seen yourself how, how nice it is where you have less callbacks. Everything happens sequentially unless you spe specifically define it. It's very nice. Um, and especially if you're working in a class with a lifecycle where you use that coroutine interface, uh, everything just looks nice. Uh, easier memory leak prevention. So uh, because you have that one additional operator of being able to cancel things, this means uh, certain operations where you would normally have all kinds of exit clauses and making sure nothing runs forever. Now it's less of a concern because you know you can cancel things. Obviously, you can still leak memory with coroutines, but it's at least easier to prevent bad leaks. Uh, mortals can comprehend. So this obviously goes hand in hand with the first point, which is code readability. Uh, if you look at something like Oryx Java or even some of the async tasks with lots of callbacks, it's a bit difficult to see exactly what's going on. You have to get used to it. You have to, like, and every programmer does it a little bit differently. So it's very easy to miss exactly what's going on. And it, it gets very frustrating. But with Coroutine, it's very easy to see what is going on. And if it's not readable, it's probably either the programmer's fault or uh, there's just some crazy additional demand. It's not necessarily Coroutine's fault. In fact, I've, I've never had it be Coroutine's fault that it's difficult to read. Whereas with something like uh, Oryx Java, if it's difficult to read, sometimes there's nothing the programmer could have done to make it even nicer. It is, uh, Coroutines is very efficient. Um, there's been a few articles about this. Uh, that's not something I particularly care about that much because in an Android context, I find most of the time if there's UI stutter, if there's a slowdown or uh, uh, out of memory error or anything like that, that is almost always because of a mistake we make. It's always uh, something that we did incorrectly. It's never really been, oh, this thing could have been 10% faster and then we wouldn't have this problem. Now, obviously, you want to strive for efficiency as much as possible, uh, but in, in my case, I care a lot more about the code readability because that prevents mistakes more than uh, the efficiency. Uh, and the final really good point uh, that I want to make is that there's a lot of first-class support for GoRoutines. Uh, now, you've seen the Firebase example, but there's uh, lots of other ones. So, for example, uh, Live Data, uh, Loom, Retrofit, Work Manager, View Model, a lot of the Android architecture components and a lot of the Square libraries because uh, those uh, teams seems to, seem to have a, uh, a focus on, on using GoRoutines themselves. Uh, and most of the libraries that have Oryx Java support uh, have been getting coroutine support uh, lately as well. Um, at the time of recording, Retrofit got that uh, uh, coroutine support about uh, two weeks ago, I think. Um, and it, it makes things a lot nicer. There is some cons. So, for example, Global Scope. Uh, I, mentioned, I used it in my example because it is the easiest 
to read for someone who doesn't know coding, but it is dangerous. It's something that you need to be careful about because it is a fire and forget operation, which means uh, if, you, if you have an infinite loop inside a global scope, you can't cancel it unless you keep good memory references, if you make sure you do things right. Uh, and um, a lot of people starting out with coroutines will run into a scenario where uh, they will not be entirely sure, but global scope will work, so they'll do it, uh, which is a little bit dangerous. Uh, and coupled with that, models can still break it. So if you are working with normal blocking code, and if you're working with coroutines, and you're not aware of the existence of coroutines exactly, or how they work, you can break things because it looks exactly the same as normal code. If you're working with coroutines or not, there's, there's not a strong indication that this is an entirely different way of thinking. Uh, however, that little icon at the left tries to uh, alleviate this problem by indicating that, whoa, 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 no, this is different. There's something weird here. Uh, and that at least helps. But there, there is still that problem that a lot of people will think, wait a minute, this is, this is going to take forever. This is blocking code. This is not right. There is some confusing older documentation. Not a, not a big deal for me, um, but I think it's, it's definitely worth mentioning that if you run into documentation that ex explains uh, the experimental coroutines, you should, you should actually avoid it uh, until you know coroutines very well because there will be some confusing statements and some confusing um, there's some class names that have been subtly changed and it's a little bit tricky. So some, if you see a uh, experimental coroutine documentation, just, just don't read it. Uh, it's easier that way. And there's been a lot of good official documentation more recently. Um, and there is still some experimental classes. Uh, coroutines is very much in operation. And there's some things that I want to use, but it's still an experimental. Um, so for example, the result class, uh, which will help with something like railway-oriented programming, which I love. Uh, test coroutine context, so it's behind that little window there. Um, so get, test coroutine context was announced, uh, I think, about a month ago at Google I.O. Um, and it is supposed to help you uh, write e tests for coroutines a little bit better um, because any sort of asynchronous testing is very tricky to do. Uh, and that is supposed to help with that. But I tried it out and it didn't quite work exactly the way I expected. And I got stuck and I said, no, I'm just going <laughs> to keep writing the test the way I was before until this comes into stable and there's a bit more documentation about it. And then the flow and channel, which is more uh, in the Oryx Java observable type of things where there's uh, hot and, and, and cold uh, uh, emissions happening that you can subscribe to. Um, and these are also things that are like very experimental and I want to use them, but because I know that the experiment is kind of careful to, to use them, especially in production, because there might be some big breaking changes later. That being said, though, if there is anything that you're unsure about with all, any of these uh, experimental classes, you look at the top there, there's a very friendly community. The Kotlin uh, community and the Kotlin Slack channel that, uh, that they uh, have that anyone can join, it's very, very nice. You can ask questions about coroutine and stuff. And usually if you, if you ask a simple question, they'll just redirect you to Stack Overflow the documentation, but they're nice about it. But if you ask anything that's outside of the, the normal, it, uh, the, the people who are literally writing all of these classes and all of this, this base Kotlin things are likely to jump in and say, oh, okay, here's, here's uh, how this, yeah, you should think about this. And, um, it's, it's very nice. They're, they're very active, the, the community. Uh, so this is uh, almost finished now. The, the words that you need to keep in mind when you start to work with coroutines. So I've shown you these four before. Suspend, scope, dispatcher, and with context. Now, with context obviously needs highlighting because that's for thread switching, and it's a little bit easy to forget that part. But there's a few more words to keep in mind that I didn't uh, have time to cover, one of which is async. It has a little bit of a different uh, meaning in coroutine than it does in other contexts. Uh, 
uh, it doesn't refer to any. It it async is a specific type of class, an asynchronous operation that uh, can that should run on a coroutine context. Uh, it gets a little bit tricky, um, but it does help a lot with uh, concurrent parallel operations, which is very nice. Um, and await, which means uh, now uh, if you have async operations, you need to await their results. Um, just keep those words in mind. And then deferred, deferred refers to a result that uh, has not been launched yet. It's not been uh, achieved yet. Uh, so deferred is used to define uh, suspend functions with a returning value that you will launch later. And then a job. A job is a reference to a coroutine that is either uh, running or will run or is paused or is cancelled or is completed. Um, so just keep an eye out for those words when you start working. And finally, question. So this is not a live stream, but I gave this talk before. Uh, and the questions I remember, one of which was um, someone said that they have a strong Oryx Java base uh, in their code base. Uh, they're very deeply invested in Oryx Java, but they are interested in code. And so he wants to know um, how I would suggest going about this, because is it worth it to start switching over now? or should they wait, or should they do it in parts or do a big refactor? Uh, and my suggestion was because coroutines makes the biggest difference for API calls or very long running operations, the longer the, the, the operation is, the bigger the benefit. Uh, my suggestion was to replace just the API calls. And especially if they use square libraries like Retrofit, it should be fairly easy to replace the Oryx Java based uh, or non oryx java uh, retrofit API calls with suspend functions. Uh, it'll, and if that works and the team starts to understand coroutines a little bit better, it will be a very good point to learn from that and then go to slightly more complex things. Uh, and yes, it is definitely worth it. Um, just the, the code readability uh, alone for me is, is worth any, any cost. Uh, the other question I got was uh, more from a backend perspective. A um, backend developer said, asked me about uh, the long computation operations um, and where the coroutines would be helpful for that. Now, unfortunately, I come from a more Android background. I'm not as used to uh, to backend operations and. Uh, the impression I got was that coroutines were more efficient than something like Oric Java, but that depends a lot on how you code it. And unfortunately, I, I wouldn't know enough about that specific use case to know whether coroutines is better uh, or just equivalent and, and not going to give you much more of a gain than a, than a minor you know, 1% or something that if that's worth it then they should do it but um, like i said i don't know enough unfortunately um and i think those there was another question i can't remember but uh, if you do have any questions please feel free to ask them uh wherever i post this and i should hopefully see it and respond uh, thank you for listening